Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, it looks like we're finally getting some good news on the COVID-19 front. You guys have heard that it looks like things may start opening back up, and that's really good news. Amen? Amen. God willing, we'll be gathering once again as a Celebrate Jesus Church, as a congregation, and the churches throughout the city and the state, the nation, and even around the world. We'll be gathering together as church family and and just, uh, there's power when we come together, when we, when we worship together, when we pray together, when we're like-minded and when we're of one accord, there's power in that. A bad wind has blown across our land and this wind deposited a spiritual substance upon our households, our neighborhoods, and our cities. This spiritual substance has left a residue of fear, apprehension, uncertainty, and suspicions. There are divisions in our society being exposed and in some cases exploited. A bad wind has blown across the hearts and minds of the citizens of this great nation and has caused many to despair. Neighbors are looking at each other differently. And I find it personally somewhat distressing that social distancing is so easily accepted and so many are comfortable with social distancing. Folks are choosing sides, the naysayers versus the yaysayers. After Jesus was crucified, his followers also fell into fear, into despair, into uncertainty. A bad, evil wind had blown across the land and had left a residue upon the hearts and minds and the lives of the followers of Jesus. But a good wind of hope began to blow. All was not lost. Nothing was lost. Much was gained. Jesus rose. Jesus ascended into heaven. And the long-awaited king assumed his throne. And remember, before he left, he promised to send a mighty cleansing wind, which would blow away the residue upon the hearts of his disciples. The good news is that the mighty wind of change has not stopped blowing. Today, the promise of the Father whom was sent by the Son is still blowing. Today, all is well because Jesus is still the King and He never leaves us and He never will forsake us. Amen. Today, church, God's Holy Spirit has a message for us. Amen? Amen? Father, we just pray that you would reveal to it, to us and to our hearts and to our spirits and to your charge at large, Lord, what it is that you have to say. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have chosen to speak to us this morning, Lord. Help us be receptive. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I want to talk on the topic, a mighty wind this way comes. The Bible can be separated into the Old Testament and the, the New Testament. In between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 400 years pass. Those years, during those 400 years, there is no new revelation. We identify those 400 years as the silent years. God did not speak to man, although his hand was active. And some of the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled during those 400 years. So his plans and his purposes were going forth, but God did not have any prophets. He did not give any new revelation. And between the Old Testament and the New Testament, those 400 years pass. And as the New Testament opens, we find four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are first-hand accounts of Jesus' earthly ministry. After Jesus was crucified, he rose from the dead, and after he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, where he sits on his throne as King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. After the four Gospels, we come to the book of Acts, which recounts the birth of the church, which Jesus said he would build, and in which we as Christians are living stones. As the book of Acts opens, we find the disciples in Jerusalem as they prepare for the day of Pentecost, which has its roots in the Old Testament, and is one of the many foreshadowings of the gospel of salvation by faith in Jesus as Savior. 
For we, as for we Christians, we celebrate Pentecost 50 days after the resurrection. In the Jewish faith, Pentecost is celebrate, celebrated 50 days after Passover. The author of the book of Acts is Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke. Mm -hmm. And as we look at the Gospel of Luke, we see he ends and, and he retells of, of the ascension of Jesus. And as Acts opens up, we see that he picks up where he left off. And so why don't we do that? Just for a little bit of background so we can get our bearings here. Let's go to the, to the book of Luke, the last final verses of Luke. And in Luke chapter 24, 4, verse 50, he writes, And he's, he, Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. In another gospel, it says that he blew on them. He blew on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit, which was yet to come, as we're going to see at a later date, as a, as a documented in the book of Acts. Verse 51, now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was, he was parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So we see that they left for Jerusalem. Now we go to the book of Acts and we find that that's exactly where Luke, the same writer, picks up the story. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made of Theophilus, he's writing to a man named Theophilus. And some people believe that he was a, an important Roman official. It's not known if he was a believer or not. And he's saying, remember the book of, that I wrote, the gospel I wrote? Well, the former account I made of Theophilus, all, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, he through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. And so he's saying, remember where I left off before? Go to, down to verse um, 9. Let's pick it up at verse 6. Let's go to verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, which will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? So what's going on here? This is the resurrected Jesus, and he goes and meets with his disciples, and they still don't quite understand. He said, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? He, see, they're thinking that he's going to be an earthly king. Amen. Verse 7, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and uh, Judea and Samaria and into the end of the earth. So here they are. They are... I would imagine somewhat fearful. I would imagine they are somewhat confused. I would imagine they're somewhat disappointed because they had been following Jesus and they witnessed his crucifixion. And although they had witnessed his ascension, they, had, they still had some uh, things to come into a fullness of under understanding. But what happened, if you look a little bit earlier in the Gospels, it says that Jesus opened their minds and opened their hearts and opened their understanding to understand the scriptures. Amen? So they're coming into a deeper revelation of what Jesus came to do, why he had to do it in that particular way, and who he is as the Savior and King. And so we go to book, uh, continue in the book of Acts, and let's go to um, 12, chapter 12. We're going to get there, you guys. I'm going to get some things out of here. I'm just trying to lay out the, backward, the, the background here. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. And he said, And they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of, of that guy, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with women, with the women Mary, mother of Jesus, and his brother. So they're all in the medium. They're praying and they're trying to figure out what their next move is because they're trying to stay faithful to what Jesus commanded them to do before he would ascend. And he said, stay in Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they're waiting and they're praying.
praying and they're of one accord. And here we see, here's our point. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. A mighty rushing wind. And this is describing the coming of the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, wind and breath and breathing have spiritual implications. And if we can come to understand the spiritual implication, we can gain practical applications to our own lives. And right now, there's a, a bad wind over our land. And God says, I am going to send a good wind. Just as what was going on in the days when Jesus had left and the disciples were confused and a bad, mighty wind had fallen over the land, they were of one accord and, and locked in their houses, locked in their room, as so many believers yeah, are now. And they say, God, I need a refreshing, yeah, I need a new breath, I need you to send your mighty rushing wind to blow away the Amen. residue that has been deposited on my life. Amen. I want to look at some things in regards to what the Bible says about the wind. One is, bad men blow like winds of confusion. We'll look at that. Another one, God is the source of the good wind of truth. How about righteous living brings calm winds of blessing? How about righteous living leaves Holy Spirit evidence? How about Jesus has power over the bad wind? Of life trials. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In this section, if you read this whole chapter, you'll, you'll see it, it's giving instruction like all the epistles, like all the letters do. It's written to churches and he's giving instructions. He said, God has placed giftings upon the individual believers. Last week or in the, in the previous studies, we learned that we are living stones within the structure of the church. And we, as living stones, God has given us spiritual giftings so that we can move and be equipped to the fullness so that we can be efficient and productive and fruitful members or living stones within the body of Christ, the structure of the church when Jesus is building. And so if we look at here, Ephesians chapter 4, it says that he said, and he says, I, I'm giving you spiritual gifts so that you can be spirit, uh, fully equipped for, verse 14, verse 14, we pick it up, so that we no longer should be Children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. There's that wind. The wind of doctrine. What's doctrine? Teaching. He said there's bad teaching out there. There's false teachers out there. He said be thoroughly equipped. Be grounded in, the, in your word. Walk in the spirit. Use your discernment so you're not tossed to and fro by these bad winds of doctrine. And what is the source of these bad winds of doctrine? It's right here. They come from the trickery of men. In the cunning craftiness, deceitful plotting. There's a lot of deceitful plotting going on out there. There's men and uh, organizations or, or uh, forces that are seeking to use trickery and cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting to gain advantage through this residue that has been deposited upon our land. Amen? Amen? Bad men blow like winds of confusion. How about God is a source of good? The good wind of truth. Let's go here. We can go to 1 Timothy or I could just read it. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy says, All scripture is given by inspiration. That word inspiration means it is God breathed. It means that God has breathed into all scripture. All scripture has, God has breathed right into it. It says, once again, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That means good teaching. For reproof, that means to making sure something's correct. For correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
instruction in righteousness. Why do I need instruction in righteousness? See, the Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. But why is it that we need instruction of righteousness? Because sometimes we can be a little unrighteous. Sometimes we can be self-righteous. So that every man of God may be complete. That means spiritually mature. You can only become spiritually mature by knowing what the word is and going through life trials and, and building your life and your responses against these trials like that, that residue that's over our land now if we understand what God instructs us to do in the situation. Amen? Amen. That every man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible says that we are created for good works which God prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. See, God has placed good works in our path. He's placed good works for me. He's placed good works for you. And he says, when you come to that place, and there, I place an opportunity before you. If you understand, what, if you're walking by my spirit, you're going to recognize this is something I need to do, and your God will bless that good work. Amen? Amen. Bad men blow like winds of confusion. God is the source of the good wind of truth. How about righteous living brings calm winds of blessing? Let's go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 in the Old Testament. Psalm 1, verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. He shall... Be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. That's the godly man. That's the man who walks in the ways of God. That's the one who walks in the calmness and the coolness of the day and enjoys the winds of truth, the winds of blessing. But not so the ungodly man. We continue in verse 4. But the ungodly are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, not sinners in the congregation of righteousness. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. What does that mean? We were created for good works which God prepared beforehand, and if we walk in those, those are things that produce fruit. If, for the ungodly, they're like the things that they do. It's like throwing the wheat in the in the wind, in the air, and that that bad wind blows it away, blows it away. Even the wind of God blows it away because there's no redeeming value in the things that they do because the motivation of their hearts, the source of the trickery of men, it says we just read, the cunning craftiness of men, all those things that are that seem to be piling on. I, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I, I watch the news and some of it's a little scary. There's some agendas out there that are really trying to usurp the, the ways that God would have us as a nation move. God wants us to move in this direction, but they want us to go in that direction. Amen? Amen. And I'm trying to, to draw a line between politics and what we're saying here. Amen? Amen. God is the source of the good wind of truth. Righteous living brings calm winds of blessing as opposed to the wind that blows away the ungodly works like chaff in the wind. Righteous living leaves Holy Spirit evidence. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. What's going on here is there's a religious leader and he, because he's under pressure, because of his position, because of who he is and his position within that religious orga uh, organization, but also he's a political figure because in, in, in this setting, um, it was a the religious leader had leaders had a lot of political clout and responsibility, so they were trying to compromise with um, not being exposed as being a follower of Jesus. And what's going on here? This man, this religious leader, is trying to think. Well, maybe Jesus is whom he said he is, but his the cohorts, the other religious leaders were severely persecuting Jesus and his followers. And here in John chapter 3, verse 1, he comes and he comes at night and he talks.
talks to Jesus. Verse 1, he said, verse 1 of chapter 3 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, that's teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. See, well, that's pretty good. He's, he's acknowledging he's from God, but that's not quite there. See, we can acknowledge Jesus is from God, but we have to acknowledge who he is. He is God incarnate. He wasn't quite there. He's wrestling with this. And see, what's going on here is this religious leader comes from a group of religious leaders who had been waiting for Jesus or the Messiah for generation upon generation upon generation. And here he is, but he's blinded and he's coming to a place in his understanding. Said, well, maybe this is the long-awaited Messiah. Mm -hmm. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've been looking, Nicodemus, you've been looking for the kingdom of God, and you've been searching for the kingdom of God. You've been running in religiosity after the kingdom of God, and you can't even see it because you're blinded by religion. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into a, a, his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What are we talking about here? We just saw in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit came. He's talking about unless the Holy Spirit comes upon you and into you and, and you're baptized into the Holy Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 7. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Here it is, verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you cannot hear the sound of it. And you can hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What does that mean? See, what Jesus is saying, the Christian is filled by the Holy Spirit wind. But too many, I guess I should say it this way, are a bag of wind. And they draw attention to themselves and they're running and they're doing this and they're doing that and say, look at me, look at, I am a spiritual man, I am a spiritual woman, I serve God, I do all these things and we have a tendency to say, I'm going here, I'm doing this by my own power, this is what I'm doing, this is what God's doing in me and through me and we get to a point where we start saying, this is me, it's no longer God. See, if we're walk, truly walking by the Spirit, He will lead us. I don't know where God's going to lead me, but I'm going to go wherever He leads me. See, He hasn't given me a plan. I don't know where He's going to send me. I don't even know where He's coming from, but I'm going to go in that direction because I am walking by the Spirit. And so Jesus' point is here for us to put logic and try to figure out what the Holy Spirit is going to do can be a waste of time. Is that making sense to you? Yeah. What does that mean for us? So many of us are self-isolated. So many of us are not interacting. So many of us are, and I'm worried that too many of us are okay with not gathering as a church congregation. My fear, my, um, the thing, I don't really worry about the thing I'm concerned about is that people would get comfortable in doing this. I can do Church here, okay. I can do church here, okay. And see, and then now all of a sudden they're starting to direct the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit leads us. And we can get to a place where we start directing and leading the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Righteous living brings calm winds of blessing. Righteous living leads Holy Spirit evidence. Holy Spirit evidence. Not gene evidence. Not you evidence. Holy Spirit evidence. Amen? Amen? Jesus had power over the bad winds of life trials. How many know that 
There's so many of us going through life trials at this moment. Believers or non-believers, the Bible says, it says that the trials come upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Trials are common to all men. Amen? Yeah. And so, but Jesus, the good news is that Jesus has the power over the bad winds of life. Trials go to Matthew. Is this speaking to anybody yeah. out there? Yeah. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Verse 23, we pick it up. So Jesus is ministering, and the people are coming, and the crowds are coming, and the disciples are assisting Jesus, and sometimes they, can, they were getting overwhelmed. So many people came, and it was a, I could imagine Jesus was exhausted. Remember, he was fully human. The disciples are tired. They're all tired. Verse 23 of chapter 8, Matthew now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly, and suddenly, a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but Jesus was asleep. He was tired, but he was also full of faith. Verse 25, then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. Verse 26, but he said to them, why are you fearful? O oh, you of little faith. Then he arose and he rebuked the winds. He rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? See, they were in the midst of a great tempest. A great tempest. When I was a new believer... The minister, whoever it was, I forget where it was, a minister was talking about this, and he was made the point. He said, the sea is not just the sea, it's an illustration of spiritual buffeting, life buffeting, spiritual trials.